All right. So let me start, of course, by uh, thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here in this beautiful place. It's my first time visiting the ICTS. And of course, not to mention the um, 60 Celsius difference in temperature uh, <laughs> where I come from and, and here. So those are also very good reasons to be in, in this place. Um, so, but what I want to do today, so unlike Shiraz, I wasn't given a precise directive. So I was just told, well, give some lectures on scattering amplitudes. And this is a big subject. And in this first lecture, I would like to title it Kinematic Variables. So I'm going to try to make an experiment that I've never made in a lecture, which is uh, I'm going to try to cover an overview of the subject. And then please try to write down the topics that you find interesting so that at the end of the lecture, you can come downstairs here and talk to me. And we can discuss if any of those topics are things that we can discuss in the, in the, in the, in the coming lectures. Okay? So it's your job to keep track of the topics I'm going to mention and then highlight the ones that you would like to see in the next few lectures. Okay. But before we go into the topic, let me give some motivation for the subject. And just like in Shiraz's lecture, the story starts with Witten. But this time in 2003, when he introduced is twist or string theory. So this is a theory of strings where the target space is twist or space. And this time, the correlation functions of this object are supposed to compute scattering amplitudes in a space-time. Okay? So this is where most of the talks would usually start. You would start with the twist or the string theory and explain how many things came out of there. But as I said, I'm not going to repeat that. Instead, I'm going to show you a couple of things that have come out of many years of research and where things are more or less in two different very different uh, applications of the techniques that have been developed here. So one of them is QCD. So the theory started by considering scattering amplitudes in n equals 4 super young mills. So this is a maximally supersymmetric gauge theory in four dimensions. So many people, of course including me at the time, we thought that this connection between a special string theory that computes scattering amplitudes in a field theory. So it's not computing a scattering amplitudes in a regular string theory that has an infinite number of degrees of freedom, but this is a special string theory that computes scattering amplitudes of a field theory. So we thought that this was a miracle that had to do with supersymmetry. And moreover, it had to do with n equals 4 supersymmetry. But it turns out that luckily for us, we were wrong. So things can be generalized widely. So you can find theories that don't have supersymmetry, theories that don't even live in four dimensions. So they can live in any number of dimensions. And all that activity gave to two developments that I want to mention here. So one of them that comes from something that are called recursion relations. and generalize unitarity. Together with other developments that the QCD community were already making since the 90s, led to the state-of-the-art calculations. So what's the state-of-the-art? 
at three level, all is known. At one loop, all is known as well. And at two loops, the five gluon amplitude is the state of the art. Okay? So it will take a little bit, it would take too long to explain what the situation was before 2003, but let me say that some of these developments, especially this two loop, five loop calculation, is a very impressive calculation. And these are results that are important for the LHC. So every time you go to the next two leading order in calculations, you improve the predictions that you can make. So if you have a billion, a machine that is costing billions of dollars, you want to make sure that you can make predictions that match the experimental results or the experimental accuracy. Well, speaking of experiments that cost a lot of money, so there is also another branch that this, is, this one is more recent, and it has to do with gravitational waves. And here, of course, we know that the problem, the interesting problem is what happens when you have two compact objects interacting through gravity in spiraling and merging to produce another compact object. So that's called the binary merger problem. And it has three stages. One is called the inspiral, the merger, and the ring down. And this is the region where all the techniques that people have developed over the years in scattering amplitudes are starting to be used in this completely, seemingly completely different problem. So this is something very, very new, maybe just a year old, that people have started to look seriously into this problem. And there was even a conference recently devoted to that. So this is an area that is very exciting, and I hope that some of you might get into that. Okay, very good. So the other deal that I want to make with you is the following. As I go along and explain some of these kinematics, now we're going to go to the topic. I hope I motivated you a little bit. Um, so we're going to go into the topic of the lecture. So the deal that I want to make with you is the following. As we go through the topics, I'll mention two or three open problems. And then these are things that you can think about. Okay? The lecture today is going to be very trivial. Everything is going to be just linear algebra. But these are open problems. And of course, the deal is that if you find any solution or any good ideas about it, you come and talk to me first before you talk to anybody else. <laughs> OK. Now that we have understood ourselves, um, let's start. So yes. Yeah, this is different from that. Yes. Okay, very good. So let's start with the topic, which are kinematic variables. So as I said, we're not going to do anything complicated today. We're going to start with the observation. So this is point zero. That is scattering amplitudes. distributions. Okay. So we all have seen that when we try to compute the scattering amplitude of scalar particles, gluons, gravitons, any kind of particles that you want, the scattering amplitude has to do something special. So from now on I'm going to denote the momenta of the particles it is. So this is going to be the particle index. Okay. And this is our vector index. At this point, I'm not thinking about any particular dimension. 
And for me, all particles are incoming. Okay. So of course, we know that translation invariance When it acts on, when you apply a translation on the amplitude, the amplitude has to do something that seems strange. The amplitude has to go has to satisfy this property. And of course, we know that this property can only be satisfied. This is a translation by a vector b mu. So any object that does something like this cannot possibly be a function. It has to be a, a distribution supported where this is going to be 0. Since this has to be true for any vector, we have to require that this be true. Here I would like to include, since I, already, since I already put one delta function, doesn't hurt to put m more. So I'm going to define my amplitudes for the time being as requiring particles to be on shell. Okay? So this is the on shell condition, and we have momentum conservation. Okay. Now, the first class of theories we're going to consider are the simplest possible ones. Now, there is also a story here, like Shiraz's story, but uh, in this case, I can tell you because I can make fun of myself. So, in 2005, we wrote a paper called What's the Simplest Quantum Field Theory? And I think the view has been changing, so <laughs> now I'm contradicting myself. At the time, the claim was that it was N equals A supergravity. Okay? That might still be if it really has this a EA symmetry that we, that we saw today in one of the talks. But um, for the time being, let's start with the scalar field theory. Okay? So we're going to start with the scalar particles. And if they are scalar particles, then we know that our function A that depends on momenta cannot really be something that depends explicitly on momenta. It has to depend on Lorentz invariant contractions of this object. From now on, I'm considering massless particles. That means that all these vectors are null vectors. So this has to be a function that will depend on the Lorentz invariant inner products of the momenta. Well, you know that people like to put these, these two here and then call these the Mandelstam variables. Now, what constraints? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, I thought about that when I sat there today, and, but then I forgot. Yes. Okay. So, on the, momentum, on the momentum vectors, we have to impose these two constraints, momentum conservation and the on-shell condition. But how do they translate in terms of these Mandelstam invariants? If that's all we require, if it's our amplitude is a function of these variables, why not forget about the momentum vectors and think about Mandelstam invariants? So let's consider the metrics of Mandelstam invariants. What are the constraints this matrix has to satisfy in order to be a physical matrix that describes the kinematics of these n particles? Well, the constraints are one, that it has to be symmetric. 
In other words, SAB is equal to SBA. And the second constraint is that the sum of all the rows or the sum of all the columns has to be equal to zero. Is this one obvious? Kind of obvious, right? So if you use the definition and you put it in here, you will discover that this becomes the sum over ka dot kb, but ka can be pulled out because we are summing over b. But momentum conservation tells us that this has to be equal to ka, well here I'm summing over everything, but I could have said b different from a, then this we have been by momentum conservation minus ka dot ka, which happens to be zero by the on shellness condition, okay? So an exercise for you is to prove that any matrix that satisfies these two conditions gives rise to kinematic data that is valid, okay? So let's do some counting. So being symmetric means that we have n times n minus 1 divided by 2 degrees of freedom. Here you have n constraints. Now you put this in Mathematica, and you press Shift Enter, and you will discover, no, oh, but you have to put factor in front, OK? Then you put factor, and you get n minus times n minus 3 over 2, OK? Oh, yeah, very good. The diagonal elements are zero. Yes. So you could say, well, it's a symmetric matrix. Yes, I, I, that's very good. I thought there was something strange, writing precisely the number of components for an anti-symmetric matrix and saying that it's symmetric. But it's true. So it's symmetric. It also has another constraint, which has zero diagonals. So you're perfectly right. Very good. Yes. So even if it, even if these particles were not massless, you 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 would just have to set to modify some of the some of the constraints very easily. But the number of constraints is is, is the same. Yes. Very good. However, this is only true if the dimension of the space-time is greater or equal than n minus 1. Anybody knows why? Exactly. So there will be constraints, OK? So, for example, in d equals 4, you will find that any, any 6 by 6 submetrix of this matrix will be singular. That means that the determinant vanishes. These determinants have a name. They are called gram determinants. because they measure the linear independence of vectors, OK? So an exercise for you. So for me, EG is example, and EX are the things that you should pay attention and try to do, OK? So for example, in four dimensions, the exercise that you have to do is to show that the number of variables is actually 3n minus 10. And this number agrees with this number, or it should agree for n equals less or equal than 5. OK? Very good. Now, let's go back to our scalar particles and consider really the simplest theory you can con that you can think of. Sorry? OK, so this is, so don't cross, it's not there, it's actually here then. 
Okay, so let's make a new line here. Okay, good. So I'm also going to do something that is going to hurt a little bit, which is to write a Lagrangian. So all these years we have been trying to avoid Lagrangians. But let's, let's do it, nevertheless. So I'm only going to write the interaction part. So we're going to do just the simplest and most boring theory that you can imagine. It's a five cube theory. So the three particle amplitude, it has a single Feynman diagram, and it's just given by the coupling constant. The four particle amplitude, you don't need to think very much. You know that is given by this. Okay. So this is something that we all have done in in high school, right? So this is a this is a high school version of, and maybe even last year of high school you did the five particle amplitude. So we can have one, two, three, four, five plus fourteen other terms. Okay, so, and this in terms of kinematic invariance is given by something like, very good. Now, is there anything we can learn from such a trivial theory? Well, before I do that, I promise I was going to give you some problems or some ideas that I didn't know the answer to. And there is one here that I forgot to mention. So I'm going to write it here. So question one. Well, I'm, I doubt I can keep track of how many questions, so I'll just put the question. So the question is the following. It's based on the following observation. So given two matrices, K, okay, K and K tilde that satisfy these properties, then obviously K plus K tilde also does. So these matrices form a vector space. The question is, what's the physical meaning of this vector space? Remember the deal, okay? Very good. Now, can this simple Feynman diagram teach us anything? Yes. No, I'm thinking about large enough dimension. Thank you. Yes. Hint? No, if I, if I, knew, if I knew the answer, I, I wouldn't be asking for you. Huh? OK. So once again, the question is here, can these simple diagrams do something important? Well, in 2008, Bern, Carrasco, and Johansson, now known as BCJ. Oh, yes. thank you. Decided that these skeletons were somewhat fundamental. 
that they had to be taken seriously. So what do I mean by that? Well, we also know that if we consider Song Jiang Mills theory, the kind of vertices that we have, so remember that we're going to have vertices that come in the Lagrangian of the form A square A, and we will also have a quartic vertex. So here these A's are the gauge fields. Let me use different font for the, for the color index. So if we are thinking about gauge theory that has gauge group UN, we know that we're going to have n square vector fields. So we have n square vector fields that interact among themselves. And the way they interact, we know very well how it happens. So there is a cubic coupling, but there is also quartic coupling. So you would think that this theory has nothing to do with this theory, or at least that there would be nothing special. But BCJ decided that if we take the cubic diagrams as the fundamental skeletons, then there will be something special. No? Very good, yes. Okay. So, what did they do? They said, well, BCJ said, these trivalent graphs are important. And we should try to write everything, every scattering amplitude in terms of these trivalent graphs. Now, the problem is that if you're giving a, a particular Feynman diagram that contributes to an amplitude of gluons, you could have a quartic vertex, and you must have a quartic vertex. So what BCJ suggested is that quartic vertices are nothing but cubic vertices in disguise. Okay? So they suggest that any quartic vertex can be expanded into cubic vertices. If you do something simple, if you multiply by the corresponding propagator, okay? Moreover, there are several ways of doing that, right? So we could have this way of doing it, plus another way of doing it, plus the third way of doing it. Okay? And as long as alpha plus beta plus gamma equals one, you have your quartic vertex. So if you insist on writing everything in terms of trivalent graphs, somehow you have found yourself in the situation of having extra degrees of freedom. So somehow some redundancy that you have put into the system that wasn't there at the beginning. So can you do something interesting with that redundancy? That's the question that they posed and answer. So BCJ found out that once you write everything as a sum over trivalent graphs, so gamma is a trivalent graph, then what you find here is the product of the propagators So I'm calling E edges of the graph. So for each edge of the graph, there is one propagator, which is a collection of kinematic invariants. Okay? 
And then there will be some numerator, first coming from here. Now you have these numerators, and also from these derivatives. So Young Mills has derivative interactions. Oh, okay. Is this okay? Can you hear me? Better or worse than before? Sorry? Okay, well, I still haven't made the statement. So remind me, remind me the, uh, which statement? Oh, no, well, this, uh, this, this is a... So you see that I didn't do anything... I, I promised that this lecture wouldn't have anything complicated. So this is all a triviality. This diagram is nothing but 1 over S12. And I multiply by S12 to get alpha. So literally, this is alpha plus beta plus 1 plus gamma. And I'm making this equal to 1. Okay? So you could do this at loop level with every quartic vertex. No matter how many loops you have, you can do that as well. Okay? But after I make the statement, remind me if I don't say anything about loop level. Okay? The BCJ statement. Well, it has to be, it has to be whatever, whatever this thing has to be. So the coupling constant is square. Thank you. Yes. Very good. Whatever this quartic diagram was supposed to do is what this is supposed to do. Okay, now we are ready for the statement. The statement is that once you do this, then, of course, for every diagram here, we also have, which I have omitted so far, something that tells us how these particles interact when they have different color. Okay? So all that is structure, I'm going to put it here into some coefficient that depends on the graph. And all the numerator factors, I'm going to put them in another factor that is called n gamma. Okay? So the fact that we can write the amplitude in this form is nothing interesting, it's fairly simple. Now, the interesting thing is that there is a lot of redundancy. And the claim is the following. So the BCJ claim is that there exist choices of the redundancies so that every property Every algebraic property that the C's satisfy can be implemented in the ends. So if you just take any random formulation of Young Mills and write it in this form and choose random values of alpha, beta, and gamma, you will find an answer. But this property will not be satisfied. Okay? So what property, what could po these, these functions possibly satisfy? So let me give you the answer. Imagine that you take the four particle amplitude. So what are these functions? Well, these functions are made out of a structure constants of your Lie algebra. And the basic property, or the defining property that these structure constants satisfy, we all know what it is, right? We could immediately say it right away. It's supposed to be they are supposed to satisfy the Jacobi identity. Okay. So every time you have any diagram that contains a sub-diagram that looks like a four-particle object, 
And you have another diagram, another trivalent graph, where everything in the graph is identical to this one, except for this trivalent, except for this four particle subgraph. So that the new subgraph is, read, is written in a different channel from this one. And you add up another diagram that is identical to the previous two, except for that one. Then we know that the sum of the three color coefficients adds up to zero. And that's the Jacobi identity. So we have C of this graph, let's call it the S graph, plus C of the T graph, plus C of the U graph, is U equal to zero. And the reason I'm calling this S, T, and U is that I didn't tell you, but for four particles, Mandelstam invariants, they have their own special name. Of course, you know this. So for n equals four, S12 is called S, S13 is called U, and S14 is called T. Okay? So every time the graph does something like this, the ends are supposed to do the same thing. Yes. You mean in the four particle vertex? Yeah, but I put it in, right? Here it is. Yes. No, but it, it behaves in the same way, right? So this trivalent graph has a propagator, and I'm putting by hand the inverse propagator. So it behaves as the original quartic graph. Oh, but only for the trivalent graphs, right? So it matches perfectly. So if you have a trivalent graph, right? Here we are mimicking that behavior too, right? So this S12 here is pretending that it's coming from the trivalent graphs in Young Mills. Okay? Yeah, they are canceling between themselves, yes. Okay. Well, if this was the end of the story, so the claim is that every time this happens, the same thing happens for the ends. And if this was the end of the story, this wouldn't be more than a mathematical curiosity. It would be fun, you write a paper, and that would be the end of the story. And nobody would be able to do anything with this, most likely. But they actually went on, okay? So this connection here is a connection between color and kinematics, or the BCJ relation, duality between color and kinematics, for obvious reasons, color and kinematics. But they went on to propose something else, which is called the double copy construction. And what it tells you is that when this is true, okay, when this by this means the connection, the special connection between color and kinematics is true, then, so I'm not supposed to write here, let's see, no, the dead. The dead line, literally, <laughs> it's over there, so we're fine. When this is true, then this object, the same object that we have there, know that I'm writing exactly the same thing that I have over there. The only difference is going to be that I'm going to put here this numerator, and here I'm going to write again the same numerator. So I'm going to remove the color factor and combine and replace it by another kinematic factor. 
then this object has the correct properties to be an amplitude. And what amplitude is that? Well, following the notation of one of the talks uh, earlier today, I'm going to use m for that one. Just to say that this is an amplitude of n gravitons. Okay? So that's a surprising thing. And now I remember, uh, uh, this is the moment that I, can, that I can answer your question, which is that this construction also seems to work at loop level. Okay? So this has been proven, so this has been completely proven at three level. At one loop. At two loops is still a conjecture. And higher loops is a conjecture. But what I can tell you is that for four particles, this has been done, or this has been shown to work at all loop orders up to four. Now, at five loops, people have tried very hard, but it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't worked yet. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. So it's still, still an open problem. OK, this is not one of the open problems that I would like to suggest to you. Okay. <laughs> if you want to try and you find that something, also tell me. But it's not in the list. Okay. So I think this one is a, it requires a, it, it probably requires a, a new idea. In any case. What's the most obvious question that you would ask at this point? We started with this formula, and we got gravity by replacing color by kinematics. Wouldn't it be fun to also do the opposite? Sure, why not, right? Let's try. So let's take this amplitude. And now, just to follow the convention, I'm going to call this amplitude little m. Can anyone think, can anyone think what, I, what I'm going to try to write? An amplitude for what? So A was Young Mills, capital M, gravity. You see the pattern? No, there is no pattern at all. <laughs> In any case, <laughs> somebody came out with this notation. I don't know. I mean, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put two color factors. So this theory is exactly this boring theory that we have here, but dressed with color factors. So this is a scalar theory that has two copies of color factors. Now, nobody told us that these two guys have to be the same. OK? So this could be different from this one. So this is a theory that could have, strictly speaking, they shouldn't be called color factors. They should be called flavor factors in this case. But allow me the the abuse of terminology, and let's call these color factors. So we need a scalar theory that has only cubic interactions and somehow transforms in some representation of un cross un tilde. Well, the first thing you would say is that if we have this, the structure constants of this theory, and we write down a scalar theory that interacts, a collection of scalar fields that interact through the structure constant of this um, flavor group, well, what do we get? We get a boring theory, right? Because these are scalar fields, they commute, and the Fs are anti-symmetric, they anti-commute. The indices anti-commute, they are anti-symmetric, so we get zero. But what if? We use this one as well. 
now we let our scalar fields to have both kind of indices. Now we get something that is perfectly sensible, and we put a coupling constant, and we get what is now known as the via joint. Scalar theory. Okay? Good. So, what do we do with this theory? Well, it also seems like a very boring theory, okay? But somehow, maybe there is something interesting about it because it came from this construction. So, the first thing that we have to do in order to start getting a handle on this theory, is to manage the color structure or the flavor structure. Okay. So, the way you do that is the following. Every time you have a Feynman diagram, you will extract all this color or flavor structure and try to reorganize it in a nice way. So how do we do that? Well, for UN, it's fairly simple. So let me give you the rules. So if you have a structure constant that appears in one of the cubic vertices, in a particular diagram, so in this diagram, we are supposed to connect these two vertices by doing the following, here we have the structure constant corresponding to this interaction with particle 1 to one particle i, which is the internal one. Here, 12, we're going to get the internal one, a3 and a4, and we are supposed to sum over ai. Okay? So this is the five, these are the Feynman rules for this diagram. And this is the color dependence in the UN part. We, are, we will also have the same thing for the UN tilde part. Okay? But what I'm going to try to teach you now is the way to simplify this into something that looks much more beautiful than this collection of structured constants all over the place. And the trick comes from the following observation. So as I wrote before, this can be written in terms of the trace of the product of generators. I'm going to expand the commutator. OK. So this object as it is has a nice interpretation or a nice graphical representation, I have to say. So we can represent this as a circle with three external legs. Okay? This is not really a diagram. It's just a representation of the trace, because the trace is cyclic. So it seems nice to draw it as a circle with three legs attached, and this has the symmetries of the trace. It's completely cyclic. And the next one would be this one here. Now, if I use this convention, this diagram can be blown up into four diagrams, right? Because each structured constant is a couple of these guys. So when I multiply them, I'm going to get four diagrams. So more explicitly, I'm going to get something that looks like this, a1, a2, a internal, minus a2, a1, a internal. And on this side, I'm going to get something that looks very similar to that, but now with a4 and a3. And I'm supposed to contract the index AI. Now, the nice property about UN is that when you contract the index, so let's consider the first term. We have A1, A2, 
and the internal index is contracted, we get A3 and A4. So this is only diagram one, contribution one. We're going to have four of them. And when we do this, diagrammatically, what happens is that the two traces fuse into a single trace. In other words, trace of anything with AI times trace of TAI times anything here, well, the two anythings should be different, so maybe I'm gonna put, uh, I'm gonna use stars here. Sum over AI becomes a single trace where the AI has disappeared, and the two traces have fused. OK. Now, putting everything together, for every Feynman diagram that I write in this by a joint theory, I perform the same operation. So every diagram now has in front of it four traces, if we're doing four particles, right? So this diagram will have four traces in front of it. What I would like to do is, instead of writing my, phi, my amplitude in terms of cubic diagrams, I'm going to reorganize them in terms of traces. And that goes by the name of the color decomposition which says that if you have any theory that has color in it, you can always decompose it according to the trace structure. So the formula I'm going to write is strictly true for three level and it's your exercise to extend it to one loop. OK? So now we are not going to sum over Feynman diagrams. We're going to sum over permutations of labels. So Sn is the group of permutations of n labels. Traces are cyclic. So we can divide by the cyclic group. So we're going to have n minus 1 factorial terms. And we're going to have particles in all possible orderings. Multiplying an object that corresponds to a collection of Feynman diagrams. Okay? which Feynman diagrams we contribute to this particular trace factor? Well, those are the Feynman diagrams that can possibly give rise to the corresponding trace. Okay? A Feynman diagram that cannot possibly give rise to that trace cannot appear in these brackets. So this is a sum over compatible Feynman diagrams. Now, these Feynman diagrams, of course, don't have any color structure in them. They are all kinematics. After all, we have taken care of all the color by pulling out the trace. So far, I've been talking about a single color structure, but we can do it for both and have a double sum. So this color decomposition that I wrote here works perfectly well for young mills that has a single color factor. But since we are doing by doing a scalar, we are supposed to also decompose this one again in terms of the second copy. This collection of Feynman diagrams has a name 
are called partial amplitudes. And the way you know that somebody is talking about a partial amplitude is that they will be very careful in giving you the order in which the particles enter. Okay? So when somebody gives you a partial amplitude, So this object is called a partial amplitude. They will tell you the order in which the particle center and the collection of Feynman diagrams that contribute to it are all possible Feynman diagrams which can be embedded on the disk so that the external legs are attached to the boundary of the disk following the order that you have decided to compute. Okay? Very good. Yeah, so when I say that, yeah, very good. So that's the definition of being something that you can embed on the disk. Okay? Or in other words, it can be planarly embedded on the disk. Exactly. Very good. Right. So this is a good point to say that, well, once again, you would suspect that all this theory is boring, right? That there is nothing interesting or something new that you could say about this. And to con I, mean, I have to confess that I also thought so until, until maybe a month ago or two months ago. Yes, I want to write the names. So just two months ago, um, I think you know this person. Okay, Arkani Hamed, Juntao, Song, and Jan. They found something interesting. For these, for these objects, and it's the following. So I told you that this is the partial amplitude with respect to this ordering, but for the scalar, th for the bioadjoint scalar theory, it has to specify two orderings. So I'm going to represent the ordering with respect to the UN here, and the ordering with respect to the UN here, to the other UN here. Okay. So what I'm going to tell you is just a glimpse of what they found. Okay, so it's your exercise, if you're interested, to find the paper and go through it. Um, I think I've given you more or less enough information to, to actually be able to, to read some parts of the paper. So take these amplitudes. Okay, so what is this? This is the sum of all possible trivalent graphs that are consistent with this ordering. Okay. So an example, let's do the four particle amplitude. Well, what are the graphs that are consistent with this ordering? This one. And this. There is only two graphs that are consistent with this ordering. So in other words, if you were asked to compute this amplitude, your answer should be 1 over S12 plus 1 over S3423. I'm setting the coupling constant to 1. OK, so that would be your answer. That's very good. And what they found here, or one of the many results they found, is that there exists a differential form, a m minus 3 differential form, which they call omega, that contains all the information for the computation of this object. Not only that, 
this differential form turns out to give you the way to relate this collection of Feynman diagrams. Of course, you're going, you can guess to what. So what is Nima obsessed about? So he ended up the last lecture, somebody told me that he told about something. Exactly. So cosmological polytopes. Well, almost everything is a polytope. Okay, so you have the cosmological polytope, and now these amplitudes, or the collection of Feynman diagrams, are computing nothing but the volume of a polytope. It's not a cosmological, well, maybe, who knows? Huh? Maybe I shouldn't say there is not. It's not known whether that's the cosmological polytope, but this one is a polytope. In fact, a very famous one is one of the most basic ones that people learn in combinatorics. It's called the associahedron. Just to give you a glimpse, the differential form for four particles is supposed to be a one form, right? Because it's an n minus three form. So this one is a one form, and it's just given by the S12 over S12 minus the S23 over S23. So if you want to know the reason for the minus sign, and you want to know many, well, I can tell you the reason for the minus sign is that whatever this differential form is supposed to be, is something that is supposed to be invariant under local rescalings of all the particles, of all the Mandelstam invariants. So this minus sign ensures that, and it ensures that the collection of Feynman diagrams with corresponding signs is the only object that can possibly do that, and that each one of these pieces corresponds to some triangulation of some polytope of the associahedron and these pieces piece together nicely to produce this object. Okay, so this is one of the things that you should, um, if you want to know more about it, um, we, can, we can decide to discuss that in other lectures. Yes. Yes, one, two, three, four, yes. Yes, so in the simplest case, we can choose them in the first part of their paper, they consider the case where the two orderings are the same. And then in a subsection, they consider the case when the, when the two orderings are different. Or when they are different, what's the rule for constructing the object? Well, you have to write down all Feynman diagrams that can be consistently drawn on both planar orderings. So maybe I can ask you, so what would have happened if I change two and three here? Why would that be? Wow. So what's this amplitude? Certainly it has to be a subset of the diagrams that we already had, because they have to be compatible with this one. But out of those two, only one of them is compatible with this one. Is that, is that clear? So my claim is that if you take this diagram, you pull it out, and you twist these legs, you can now draw it back on a different circle that has a different ordering. But this one, no matter how you twist it, you will never be able to draw it on a circle that has one, three, two, four as the ordering. Sorry? Oh, what's the question? Exactly, yes, that's why, that, that's why they can be permuted. Yeah, exactly, that's, uh, that's the reason. And since you are interested, another exercise, maybe just for you, I don't know. Compute, compute this one. 
Um, well, to tell you the other ordering, I'll have to do something like this. So pretend you didn't see this. OK, compute this. All right, so what else do we want to do today? OK, so I think we have time to go to, to move on to the second topic, which is not the scalar particles, but more general particles. OK, so when we have more general particles, well, here we did something already with them. But uh, the point is that when you have general particles, you don't have the luxury of forgetting about the momentum vectors. Okay, and replacing them by Mandelstam invariants. So now we have to deal with momentum vectors. So for two, these general particles. And as I said, our function is, our object is still a distribution, but now we have to remember that we have momenta and the dependence can be non-trivial. Of course, we can also have other objects here like polarization vectors. But for the time being, let's only worry about the kinematics and the momentum factors. OK. So we need momentum conservation. And we need the on-shell condition. In the standard formulation of these momentum vectors, this is a linear constraint, but these are n quadratic constraints. That is incredibly annoying. So wouldn't it be nice if instead of having d linear constraints and n quadratic constraints, well, of course, the, the best thing that could happen is that all are linear constraints, right? But let's not be that ambitious. Let's see if we can replace the order of things. Okay? So let's replace the n by the by the d. And that would be especially useful if we fix d to be small. So why not making it four? Okay? So if we can replace n quadratic constraints by four linear by four quadratic constraints, that would be much better than the situation we're at right now. And that's what we're going to do. And that's exactly the motivation that led people in the 80s to invent something called the spinner helicity formalism. OK, so how do we trivialize? So even better, let's try to get rid of these n quadratic constraints completely. So let's try to find new variables that will completely trivialize this condition. In order to do that, let's remember that in four dimensions, there is a nice trick that we can perform, which is to replace this vector representation by the by spinor representation using the Pauli matrices. So these are just a standard Pauli matrices. So this object is nothing but a two by two matrix, which we know very well how to write. Now, 
oh, this is for particle A. And the determinant of this is proportional to the norm of the vector, or it is the norm of the vector. And in our case, we're saying that this is equal to zero. That means that we can write the matrix as follows. So we can write it by imposing that the two rows or the two columns are proportional to each other. So I'm going to impose here that the two columns are proportional to each other. And here, this one is two. Okay. In other words, I'm going to impose that this matrix, Ka, which is a two by two matrix because these indices carry only two labels, that they, are able, they only carry two values, they can only have two values. And this object, as I said, transform in the spinner representation, in the conjugate representation, okay? They are given in terms of these new objects, and these are called spinners. They each have opposite chirality to each other, okay? Very good. Now, you see that instead of choosing momentum vectors, collections of four objects, I can now choose a collection of two spinners for each particle. And once I make that choice, I put them together and use this formula to construct these vectors, and these vectors automatically satisfy the on-shellness condition. So I was able to remove these quadratic constraints and make them trivial. But of course, there is a price to be paid. And the price, so what we got was Any object of this form is trivially on shell. We don't have to impose any conditions. Yes, so for a while we have been doing only massless particles. Yes, very good, thanks, yes. Okay, so everything is trivially on shell. Like here. But we have now made momentum conservation more complicated. So what do we have? We have four quadratic equations. Well, that's much better than n. Okay. Not only that, so we have five more minutes, so I can tell you a nice way of reinterpreting these quadratic constraints. So instead of complaining about the fact that we have four quadratic constraints, here the Philosophy would be to embrace the quadratic constraints. <laughs> Later on, we will get rid of them, but for the time being, let's embrace them. Sorry? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, that's part of the, of the questions that you should try to solve and then t only tell me. Yes. The answer is, it works beautifully in three and six dimensions, but then it gets, uh, it gets way harder if you try to go to higher dimensions. Well, to go to three dimensions, all you have to do is to set one of these k's to zero, right? So let me, since I'm giving the talk, I can choose which one. So I'm going to choose k2 to be zero. 
So this matrix becomes a real matrix, and all I have to do is to impose that this lambda tilde is, a, is exactly lambda up to a sign. So in three dimensions, all I have to do is to impose that this is equal to this. And then I'm done. Well, in six dimensions, OK, so now, OK. So in six dimensions, what do we have? Let's start with this. In six dimensions. So in, in, no, 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 it's five plus one, five plus one, yes. So what we do is that we take this guy and we contract it with this. Now. So to produce a vector in six dimensions, what you do is to take the tensor product of two fundamental representations of SU4. Right, so let's make it Euclidean for the moment, just for the discussion of the group theory. So you have SO6, the algebra is isomorphic to SU4, and the vector sits in one of these two representations. Which one it is? It's the anti-symmetric representation, right? So you have 6 plus 10. So you need these guys to be anti-symmetric. So you now you get your matrix K, A, B, for each particle. And the norm of the vector is proportional now to the Fafian of this object. Now, imposing that the Fafian vanishes is something that we can easily solve, OK? So now I have to make a decision. Um, maybe we can have five more minutes, right? OK, then, then, then I don't have to make any decisions. Yes, good. Yes. Sorry, can you speak up? For the no, in terms of oh, what's what's the meaning of this? Well, I just did. Is this right? This is momentum conservation because each vector is the sum of these matrices. I, I'm writing yes, it's just trivially the sum of the of the matrices. So I'm imposing that each component vanishes, and each component is given by these levels, alpha and alpha dot. That's why I have four, two times two this time. OK? And in three dimensions, we're going to have only three, because one of them will be redundant. Since the two spinners are the same, the one, two, and the two, one will be the same. So you only have the one, one component, the two, two component, and the one, two component. So there is only three equations that you have to impose. OK? OK, so let's finish the discussion of this part, and then, then I'll tell you what happens to that one. OK, so what is the Fafian of this object? Well, you take this matrix, the component 1, 2, the component 3, 4, minus the component 1, 3, the component 2, 4, plus the component 1, 4, the component 2, 3, equals to 0. And now, what you do is something absolutely brilliant. Instead of putting it in mathematica, you go and ask a mathematician, have you ever seen this? And then if your mathematician friend is, is any good, OK, so I'll press clear here. Good. <laughs> they would say, yes, of course, I have seen this. This is called a Plocker relation. Your variables are six variables 
six, six variables that lives in CP5. The reason is that we can rescale the variables and the condition stays the same. And what you're describing here is an algebraic variety inside CP5, which is called the Grassmannian G24, given by this. And after he tells you, or she tells you all that, you say, well, <laughs> now what? What do I do with that information? That's completely useless. You say, can you speak English or something? And then we say, OK, fine. So what it means is that these guys can be written as a 2 by 4 matrix. So this Grassmannian can be represented as a 2 by 4 matrix. Okay. And this is trivially satisfied if what you call K A B happens to be the determinant of the A column and the B column of this matrix. Okay? So if we call this, so I'm gonna cheat a little bit given that we don't have much time. So let me call this two-dimensional object lambda one, this one lambda two, lambda three, and lambda four. Okay, now this is a two-dimensional object. It has a two-dimensional a two index. Okay, so check the following. If I take the determinant of lambda one, well, also to save, to save um, writing, so I'm gonna denote the determinant of lambda a, lambda b, or in other words, epsilon alpha beta, lambda a alpha, lambda b beta. I'm going to denote this as angular bracket of a, b. OK? Just to save writing. So this is just a determinant computed by contracting these two indices with anti-symmetric tensor 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Now, an exercise for you is to check that is completely trivial, these objects satisfy that identity. 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 1, 3, 2, 4, plus 1, 4, 2, 3 is equal to 0. And the standard joke at this point is that there was a time in, in physics or in math when you could even give, get your name to an identity like this. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Now, what that means is that what you have to do is to give a collection of four spinners. Well, these are spinners under SL2, SL2C, okay? Which happens to be one of the two factors of the little group of massless particles in six dimensions. But in any case, the point that I want to make is that if you construct any vector, any matrix in this form, you are done. Momentum, uh, sorry, the on shellness condition is satisfied. Okay? Now, momentum conservation becomes something complicated again. So, momentum conservation will now be. So, let's, let's erase this nonsense. Momentum conservation will now be the following equation. Okay. And now we can end the lecture by doing the following. Since you became friends with your mathematician uh, colleague, you decided to learn about this Grassmannian business, because, well, after all, if you had known about it, you would have been able to solve that problem. So maybe there is something to it.
Then after you read a little bit about Grassmannians, you realize that this is something, this is doing something interesting. It's doing the following. Imagine that you collect that information as follows. So you have in four dimensions, you collect that information as a collection of n2 vectors. And you say, well, my mathematician friend told me that if this was 2 by 4, this thing would be something that describes or something that is known as a Grassmannian. What happens when I include more factors here? Is this still a Grassmannian? And your friend will tell you, yes, it is a Grassmannian. This is something that describes a two-plane. in CN. So it's the Grassmannian of two planes in CN. And the lambda tildes are also describing another Grassmannian of two planes in CN. And momentum conservation is telling you that these two planes, the two two planes, one associated with the lambdas and one associated with the lambda tildes. Now forgive me, I won't be able to write, to, to draw the other one properly. So we need one more dimension. Momentum conservation is telling you that these two are orthogonal to each other. So somehow, momentum conservation has always been telling us something about Grassmannians. So could there be a way of reformulating amplitudes by using Grassmannians? Well, the answer is yes, and that led to the Grassmannian formulation of scattering amplitudes. Now, in four dimensions, we have the complex Grassmannian. In three dimensions, Remember what happened to this constraint? It became something like this. So the lambda plane and the lambda theta plane became the same plane. So the two plane in has to be orthogonal to itself. And it turns out that mathematicians have studied that too, and it's called the orthogonal Grassmannian. And here is the last question of the day, which you are invited to think very hard about it and then tell me. The question is, is this also some here, why that Grassmannian, which is the Grassmannian that you will use here for, to describe four particles, why is it there, why is it useful to describe a single particle? Yeah, those might be hints. Yeah, you can dimensionally reduce, yes. Yes, that's, that's why, yeah, that's why I didn't mention five. Yes, there is something that can be done like that. Yeah, use the microphone. So is that lambda tilde alpha dot? I probably missed something. This one here? Yeah, yeah. No, this is in three dimensions. Oh. Sorry, I, I should have. Now in 3D, remember what we do is to say that lambda tilde is equal to plus minus lambda. Yes. Do, do, do you hear what? Sorry. Yes. So, so in four dim yes, in four dimensions. Yes. So you would also so you would have to generalize this formulation a little bit, but there is a simple way of generalizing it, right? So now the vectors are not null vectors. The determinant is not zero. So you would have to include another copy of these of these factors. And in fact, that's something that has been developed. Uh, a very nice formalism was developed recently for that. So there is the, the objects will carry uh, not the momentum description, because it cannot carry little group dependence, right? By definition, the little group is something that leaves the momentum invariant. 
but the amplitudes will now carry little group indices. Would there also be what? A Grassmannian formulation? Yeah, well, think about it and then tell me. No, uh, it hasn't been developed. Yes. Hello. Uh, so from the beginning, you started with the theory which have only three point vertices, means which has at least three point vertices from the starting, right? So for suppose the theory phi cube, phi four theory, there is no three point vertex. Then how this thing works? Because you reduce all these diagrams in terms of three point vertices diagrams. Well, why not? Just take any any diagram that you want, right? Your favorite diagram. Isn't this equal to this? Times some numerator factor. Right? So if you have one, two, three, four, five, six, I take this diagram times S12, S34. That's the same as this. Agree. Yeah, I agree. The thing is that if the theory does not have a three-point vertices, so you don't know the coupling constant. By little group scaling, you probably can find what is the three-point structure. Uh, well, but this is a this is even in the in the in the in the scalar case. So you don't even have little group or anything. So people people have done this in order to repeat the BCJ story that I told you earlier today for theories that definitely don't have cubic couplings, like the theory that describes interaction of massless pions which is called the nonlinear sigma model, or the first term in the chiral Lagrangian. So that one doesn't have any cubic couplings. And yet, it can be made to satisfy these color kinematics identities if you're allowed to cheat a little bit like this. Hello. How, to, how to express the polarization using a spinner in six dimension? How to how to oh how to describe the polarization vectors? Yeah, using a spinner in six dimension. Well, maybe we should discuss that together with four dimensions and, and make that part of a thing of a of a discussion, right? 